Okay, so we've derived various universal properties of thermodynamics, and now we turn to part two, which is correlation functions. Basically, I want to describe, describe how correlation functions also have certain regimes where things are universal, and uh, then to end with a few comments about black hole information. So um, to turn to correlation functions, let me set the stage a little bit. So the 2D conformal algebra is Virasoro times Virasoro. Uh, so we have generators ln and ln bar, uh, where n runs over all of the integers. And uh, the two-dimensional conformal group, unlike its higher dimensional counterpart, uh, the, the algebra is infinite dimensional. So this, of course, is going to make a big difference for the bootstrap. States are organized into primaries labeled by their dimensions, h and h of r, and descendants Uh, which are things like L minus M H H bar, L minus M, L minus N, et cetera, L bar minus R, L bar minus S, et cetera, H H bar. By the state operator correspondence, uh, these correspond to operators, and the, the particular operators that uh, live in the same conformal multiplet, uh, well, if we have the primary O, then the other operators that we're talking about here are everything that you can make out of O, the derivative, and the stress tensor. So uh, the family consists of O, things like DO, TO, T, D squared T, O, and so on. So everything you can make out of derivatives, the stress tensor, uh, and the primary. This is to be contrasted uh, to the higher dimensional case. So in the higher dimensional case, uh, when you form composites with the stress tensor, you get new primaries. Right? So the correlation functions of, uh, say, many stress tensors are not fixed by the conformal algebra in higher dimensions, but in two dimensions, they're completely fixed. What that means is that something like the stress tensor 100-point function, it, it just depends on the central charge C and could be calculated by um, the Virasoro algebra. Now, as usual, we can organize uh, correlation functions into conformal blocks. So if we take O of 0, O of ZZ bar, O of 1, O infinity, we write that as a sum over primaries I, C, O, O, I squared times the Virasoro block, which I'll write as F sub H I of Z, F so H I bar of Z bar. So this combination F times F bar uh, is the, or I guess what people call this, people call one of these the Virasoro conformal block. Uh, but the point is that in two dimensions, things factorize into left times right, or rather a sum of left times right. Um, so the full conformal block um, that's analogous to what we have in higher dimensions is f of z times f of z bar. So this is this stick diagram exchanging the OI. And again, uh, because of Virasoro, this exchange of O in higher dimensions, well, Again, contrasting to higher dimensions, um, there you would be exchanging O and all its derivatives. But in two dimensions, you're exchanging O, all of its derivatives, and everything you can get by dressing it uh, with the stress tensor and stress tensor derivatives. So there's a lot more hiding in this Virasoro block than there is 
in the conformal block in higher dimensions. Now, T mu nu in the CFT is dual to G mu nu in the bulk. Um, so intuitively what this means is that in ADS3 CFT2, unlike the higher dimensional case, the exact nonlinear gravity contribution to everything, to blocks, I mean rather to correlation func to all your correlation functions, to uh, partition functions, is encoded in the Virasoro conformal blocks. Well, that's good, but uh, there's no such thing as getting something for free. So, um, of course, these Virasoro conformal blocks are extremely complicated objects. Uh, the blocks F are uh, in many ways more complicated than their higher dimensional versions, um, but um, there are lots of tools for, for working with them in the limits that we care about. So they have no closed form, but they're first of all obviously fixed by Virasoro. So you can calculate just using the algebra, f of z is um, z to the minus hi times 1 plus some number times z plus dot, dot, dot. And depending on how patient you are with the Virasoro algebra or Mathematica, you can calculate it this way purely using the algebra to whatever order you want. They're known in some limits, analytically, that is, we have closed form expressions for the Virasoro blocks in certain limits, and I'll describe one of those limits later. And there's a very fast recursion formula for calculating the Virasoro blocks. Uh, so this was uh, found by Zemlogikov a long time ago. Uh, and you can find various papers on the archive where it's implemented and the code is provided um, in, the, in the archive submissions themselves. OK, so in practice, these Virasoro blocks really aren't that bad. You can calculate them by this recursion uh, to, well, actually, the recursion is not in the variable z. It's in a variable called q. Uh, so q is a more efficient way of encoding these blocks. It's, a, it's an elliptic function of z. But anyway, you can use this recursion formula to calculate the blocks to order q to the 100, q to the 1,000. Uh, and at least as long as you stick in Euclidean signature, uh, you can do absolutely as well as you'd, you, these are, these formulas are basically numerically exact. I mean, you can calculate these things to many, many digits. Now, the situation is more complicated when you go to Lorentzian signature because uh, then you can have uh, tiny, tiny tails in these function, exponential tails that you're very interested in. And uh, then, uh, then you can only get so far uh, with numerics, but you can actually get pretty far. Okay. So, um, so far this is just, this is just uh, standard uh, CFT stuff. It didn't, I didn't say anything about holography. This is all true in any theory. Uh, now, let's turn to the holographic case. So in the holographic case, uh, we have this large number c. And uh, the physics is going to depend a lot on the dimension of the operator and how it compares to c. So let me give these operators some names. We're going to call operators v, 
very light. if the scaling dimension is order c to the 0, or 1. Maybe I'll call these VL. I don't know if I'll need that. We'll call the medium or probe operators uh, for 1 much less, much less than h much less than C. So one way to think about these medium or probe operators is that um, they're order C, but with a tiny coefficient. And we take the order of limits in the way I just said. So first we take the large C, large H limit, and then we take the small epsilon limit. So these are, this, is, this is the same as, as saying h lies much bigger than 1 and much less than c. And uh, those are the medium operators, so I'll give them, a, give them an m. Caveat, um, so often in the literature, these are called light. I'm avoiding that in this lecture because they're even lighter ones. They're really not that light. They're pretty heavy. They're just um, not as heavy uh, as c. And then there are the truly heavy operators. So these are the ones with h uh, of order c with an order 1 coefficient. So I'll give those an h. And the statement in holographic theories is that correlators of certain medium and heavy operators are universal in the same sense as the thermodynamics that we've just discussed so far. That is, they're independent of the specific CFT. And uh, the reason they're independent, or the, the way to think about uh, why they're independent of the specific CFT is that on the gravity side, they're dual to, geom to things you calculate just using gravity. These are just geometric quantities. Dual, so these, these are correlators are dual to geometric calculations. So in the partition function, you know, we had any theory within this class had black holes and therefore had universal thermodynamics, because black holes have universal thermodynamics. Same thing is going to happen here. If we can find a, an observable that's calculated by something geometric, like the length, uh, the, like the geodesic length and some background, then it's going to apply to a whole wide class of CFTs. So these are the specific observables that we're interested in here. Of course, it's a duality, and all the observables have to match exactly. Um, there are cases where we have specific supersymmetric theories on both sides, and you can match lots of observables exactly. Um, but this is, sort of a, this is sort of a complementary point of view, uh, where the idea is to match things that are universal across a whole wide range of theories. And in that case, we can only ma expect to match things approximately in certain limits, uh, like with these heavy correlators. Questions so far? So you have four heavy operators. What do you expect to do? I'll come to that. Okay. I'll talk about that one. Yeah. Uh-huh. That's right. Uh, 
Um, so the, the statement of ADS CFT is that uh, each field in the bulk has a score corresponding operator in the boundary, and the, you know, the, the, the boundary values of the field are sources for that operator. And uh, this is the only way it can work, because we have a, if we have a massless field in the bulk, which is a graviton, then that has to be dual to conserved current in the boundary. And if it's spin two, the conserved spin two current is the stress tensor. So that's the only way it could make sense. Now your question about the Schwarzian uh, is an important one. It should be that somehow the Schwarzian is apparent in the, in the action on the metric in 3D gravity too. And I'm not going to go into this, but that turns out to be the case, that um, if you're careful about, um, under, about defining the um, stress tensor at the bound, uh, well, about defining the energy in the bulk, then that energy is equal to a pure boundary term, and that pure boundary term does transform exactly with the Schwarzian with the correct value of the central charge. So this was um, basically seen in, in a different language by Brown and Hano, uh, but more recent, more, more, a more modern way of doing it is to think about the Brown-York stress tensor, the ADS3, and it, and it has exactly the right transformation properties. Other questions? Now, okay, so we have these three types of operators. On the gravity side, the conformal dimension is like mass times the ADS radius. Well, this is true at large enough mass. Um, so uh, we can give an interpretation to each of these three types of operators, the very light, the medium, and the heavy. The very light operators correspond to light bulk fields that obey some wave equation box phi equals something, some sources on the right hand side that will depend on exactly what theory you're interested in and exactly what, long, what Lagrangian you write down in the bulk. This is essentially why they're not universal. The correlators, uh, say, of these very light operators will depend in detail on uh, what interactions you write on the right-hand side. The medium, or probe particles, or probe operators, rather, uh, correspond to bulk particles. Why do I call them particles? Um, because they have high mass. Because they have a large mass, these particles will uh, travel on geodesics. And um, this means that as long as we don't give them some very, uh, as long as we don't couple them uh, in some way to fields that are turned on in the bulk, uh, we expect all of these medium operators to have, to have basically the same physics. If we calculate a correlation function, it's going to be calculated by doing a, calcu doing a WKB geodesic calculation. And all particles move on the same geodesics, so um, we can expect to get some universal answers out of this. This is what I mean by, by, um, dual to, by having uh, correlators that are dual to geometric quantities. If something that travels on a geodesic, a geodesic is just a property of the geometry. It's not specific to the details of that operator. The heavy operators, H, are dual to black holes. Or defects, um, because if H is order C, that means that the mass is, or, is of order the Planck mass, or much bigger than the Planck mass. And uh, if you have something that massive in your gravity theory, this is going to have gravitational back reaction. So the heavy particles, uh, or the heavy operators, um, 
will be dual to non-trivial geometric backgrounds like black holes and defects, things where the metric responds to the presence of that operator. Okay, so um, let's see how we would actually calculate something uh, in the case where we expect things to be universal. I'll take the example uh, where O is a heavy scalar. Uh, so you might call it, and, and uh, we're going to calculate G is O, 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 O. So this is the correlation function of four identical heavy scalars. You might call this a heavy, 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 heavy correlation function. By the usual uh, conformal block decomposition, so the, just writing down the conformal block decomposition, this is sum of our primaries, ci squared, f h i of z, f h i bar of z bar. I'm, ex I'm suppressing the dependence on the dimension of O, but it's in there implicitly. Um, so what are we going to, so where do we go from here? At this point, uh, we need to know something about the blocks. You know, if the blocks are just some random functions where everything's order one, these coefficients are some coefficients that we don't know, then we haven't even specified what theory we're talking about. Uh, we, we, need some, we need to know something further about this to make any progress. And uh, the key step was made actually in the 80s. So, Zamologikov in the 80s um, conjectured that there's something called a semi-classical Virasoro block. So the conjecture uh, is that as c goes to infinity, And all of the weights go to infinity, so hi goes to infinity, delta o goes to infinity. The Virasoro block f exponentiates into minus c over 6 times little f. I guess I should call this HO because we're in chiral. Okay, so um, there's the conjecture. The conjecture is that as we take uh, both the central charge and the weights all to infinity with the ratios held fixed, then um, the only dependence on the central charge itself shows up exponentially like this, and what we're left with is just a function of the ratios. This is certainly not guaranteed for any old function. This is some very specific uh, thing that has to happen if you take log f. You, know, you, can, you can see this explicitly. So uh, the first thing to do if you want to talk about semi-classical blocks is download one of these Mathematica packages that calculates blocks for you and um, calculate f to, I don't know, order 6 or something. Take its log and uh, then take the large C limit with these ratios held fixed. It's, it's a lot of magic cancellations that occur uh, that allow you to do that. So there's a lot of magic hiding in the asymptotics of the block uh, that allows it to exponentiate like this. So Zemlogikov's argument uh, came from Louisville CFT. So Louisville CFT 
has the central charge uh, essentially as a free parameter. And there's a path integral for Louisville uh, where at large central charge, you expect to be able to do things semi-classically. That is, you expect to get correlation functions given by e to the c times stuff. Now, once, once you've argued that in Louisville CFT, it has to be true in general because the blocks don't care what CFT you're in. They just depend on the Virasoro algebra. So if you have some argument that the correlators exponentiate in Louisville, uh, then you can guess that it's true for the blocks. This still hasn't really been uh, proved as a mathematical statement that, um, that mathematicians are happy with, but this is a true fact about uh, conformal blocks. You can check it to order 100, um, and that's proof enough for me. Um, what this means for the correlator is that uh, when we go, so let's look back at the correlation function. And if you ignore the coefficient here for a minute, what we have now is a sum of exponentials. When you have a sum of exponentials, you can just pick the biggest one. You don't have to do the sum. Okay, so. Uh, that's the magic of this exponentiation, that we can just evaluate the correlator. Um, now, ignoring the, well, let me say it this way. Um, G is approximately, in the large C limit, equal to the max over all contributions of C i squared e to the minus C over 6 f of z minus c over 6 f of z bar. Questions so far? Uh, yeah, I'm assuming there's just one. If there are two, then um, things get a little tricky and we have to be more careful with the order of limits, but we can also make sense of that case. Is there another one? The question is um, whether this is really true when it's an infinite sum. And um, I think that depends on the asymptotics of both the blocks and the OPE coefficients. So I'm going to assume that it's true. And I'll make a couple of comments about this later, but I'll say quickly now that this is not a rigorous derivation in the way that the, in the, way that the partition function was. <coughs> This is more like a sketch of a, of a plausibility argument that these things are universal. And in fact, we don't know what the necessary and, and sufficient conditions are in order for this to be um, precise. What about the piece of like, the mass of the case? Um, I'm about to drop the C squared. Let me, let me come back to it. Yeah. Why would you drop it? Um, I'm about to drop it, and I'll and I'll give a I'll try to make excuses when I do that, but they won't be great ones. And the truth is that um, we don't exactly know when you can drop it and not drop it. If you assume that if well, okay, I'll I'll come to it in a minute. Yeah. OK, so now I'm going to do this step that everyone is objecting to in advance, which I think is a reasonable objection, is that um, at this point, you might guess uh, that if the spectrum is sparse enough, then uh, really this should just be dominated by the contribution of the vacuum state. 
So why is that? Well, if z is small, then uh, we know that the correlator has to factorize on the vacuum for small z. And um, it seems that this is also true for finite z. Um, this is really a matter of how big the OPE coefficients are. And if the OPE coefficients are, are too big, then this argument won't work. So you have to assume something about how big the OPE coefficients are to make this argument. Uh, but exactly what you need to assume and exactly what that imposes on the theory is not really known. I'm just going to assume that this is true, so that, um, that there's some condition you impose that this is now vacuum dominated. That is, uh, for small-ish but finite z, the correlator g is approximately given by exponential minus c over 6 f of 0 z minus c over 6 f of 0 z bar. Um, this exponentiation. So the exponentiation doesn't hold for finite. I don't think it holds for finite HI, but the limits of, but it does hold for the vacuum. Okay, so there, there's a limit where you take this, there's a limit where you take them big and then you can take HI small. And that commutes with the limit if you just take HI small first and then apply the Zen logic off argument. So it does work for the vacuum. So that's what this is saying. It's saying that the block, it's saying that the correlator, this zero here is the, is the dimension of the, of the vacuum. Okay, so it's just saying that the correlator here is given by the Virasoro vacuum block. What's the picture that you're associated with this process? Is it two faraway black holes that are doing almost nothing? Or is it the picture you're Yeah, that's basically right. They don't really have to be that far away. I'll sort of draw a picture, but in words, the answer is that um, the black holes don't, no, they're not far away. They're not far away. They actually affect each other. There are two black holes, which are having a big effect on each other, and that makes these functions very hard to calculate. No, so that's so so, yeah. and if they change a lot, why would it affect the three point function? Did it not happen in the middle and there's something else to be exponentially small because it's like a binary process? And then it should definitely compute. Right. Okay. So is is it not the case that, so if they were very far apart, then we would just replace this by literally the identity itself, like z, just the power, z to the minus delta. Um, and that's not what we want to do. So these are like the in terms of black holes or something, these are two black holes that are close to each other, that have a that have completely finite back reaction, but we're essentially assuming that it's only through gravity. As long as they're only interacting through gravity, it can be very strong interaction through gravity, but it's completely captured by the blocks. So why is that statement correct? How do you know that statement? Um, it's not always correct. It's not always correct. So there are. Um, Cases that we know of uh, where matter fields can be turned on in some particular state, and this won't be true for those operators. I'm making some assumptions about the operators here. What's the interpretation of C squared? Isn't it the overlap between the original state and the intermediate state? That's you right. Want, you want to give some of that interpretation to the blocks, right? Normally we don't do it, right? Normally we interpret the C squared as really the three point function. We don't put part of the three point function in the blocks. No, I'm just assuming it's not exponential. It's not that I've absorbed it into the blocks. Um, Big 
things and the intermediate state is big but very different from the other two. There is a very small overlap between those states and it should be exponential. That, that is the intuition. That's, that's, the intuition that, that's the intuition that we shouldn't have very big C's here that will mess up the saddle point or mess up the vacuum dominance. If C here was exponent, was e to, if this coefficient grows as e to the C, then we're in trouble, and I think nothing I, nothing I say afterward will be true. No, no, that could be exponentially small. It's e to the minus C. If this is exponentially small, then we're certainly going to be dominated by the vacuum state. I could not shake the... That won't affect, that, so the, yeah, that won't affect it. This isn't, so we either pick the saddle or we pick the, big, we pick the end point. Right, when we don't, this is more like picking the end point. And if you add a e, e to the minus c coefficient here, it won't affect the fact that we're dominated at the end point, which is the vacuum. OK, so under these assumptions, um, which can be verified in various cases, uh, the statement is that these heavy, 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 heavy correlators are given by the Virasoro identity block. Now, this statement can't exactly be true. Let me come back to that. But I'll repeat again uh, that this includes not just the factorize. This, is, this is not, does not mean that they don't interact. It doesn't mean that they factorize. Uh, this little f is a very complicated function of z uh, that can't, can't even be calculated in closed form. It can be calculated or by order, just like the block itself, or in various tricks. Uh, but it's a complicated function. And that's because this Virasoro identity block includes all the descendants of the vacuum. In particular, it includes the stress tensor itself and everything you can make out of the stress tensor and derivatives. So it's not that we're taking some kind of limit where they don't interact. Is that we're, we've written down the answer that resums the contribution of everything you can make out of the stress tensor. Can I think of this as the action of the multi center, two center PTZ minus the action when they are separated? Could this be the, the contribution? Can, can I think of this exponential? Yes, I think so, yeah. I don't, I don't think you have to subtract anything. It's just, it's just the action. I'll, I'll write that in a minute. Now, it can't literally be what I just wrote. At, finite, at all finite z, because this violates crossing symmetry. We've just taken the identity in the s channel. Uh, but uh, an argument a lot like the argument that we gave for the partition function, in this case, is less controlled because of this issue with the OPE coefficients. But a similar argument, uh, you can say that uh, the full answer is just the sum of this term and its modular images. So in this case, uh, g. The statement is that to leading order, uh, g of zz bar is approximately the identity in the s channel. Plus the identity uh, in the t channel. So uh, this is just swapping z to 1 minus z. So this is with f of z in it, and this is with f of 1 minus c. Um, this is a lot like the partition function in that as long as we're in Euclidean signature at least, um, it's convenient to write this as a sum, but for practical purposes, it's just pick whichever one is larger. So just like in the partition function, remember there we had a sum of two of the vacuum in the S channel, and the va or the vacuum on the torus and the vacuum on the dual torus. And there was a phase transition at beta equals 2 pi, where the saddles exchange dominance, and we switch from one answer to the other. The same thing is true here. Uh, in this case, uh, the phase transition is at z, z bar equals a half. 
I don't think it's really known how to deal with that phase transition when Z, Z and Z bar are different. I think that's an interesting question. Uh, but there's some phase transition where these exchange dominance and the answer suddenly jumps from one channel to the other. The U channel is subleading in this. It's not, it's not a, I guess it's plus one or something. So I think it's not, uh, is that right? No, sorry, maybe, maybe, um, plus the U channel. Yeah, plus the U channel. Other questions? Let's turn to the gravity side. So on the gravity side, uh, this heavy, 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 heavy correlator is supposed to be calculated by a gravitational path integral. Let's work in Euclidean signature, uh, then um, the action that we'll put in is just basically 1 over g Newton, root g r plus 2 over L squared. Now, how do we put in the operators? Well, the usual ADS-CFT dictionary tells us that we're supposed to do the path integral with a particular boundary condition on the fields at infinity. So for these operator insertions, this tells us we should impose the boundary condition Uh, that g mu nu is singular at the insertions with a singularity that looks like hi over z minus zi squared. Where did this come from? So uh, the the what we can do is we can ask, what is the stress tensor in the presence of these operator insertions? And then uh, the stress tensor is dual to the metric. So we should, give, we should um, set boundary conditions on the metric to have the right uh, behavior near the boundary. So uh, in principle, you, can, you could do the gravitational path integral with these boundary conditions. And it's going to be dominated by some saddle point. So if it's dominated by the saddle point, then the basic form we expect to get from doing some semi-classical analysis on this path integral is e to the minus the Einstein action on the saddle point. There will be, of course, there are going to be corrections to this formula. There will be loops. And there will be non-perturbative contributions, uh, say, from other saddle points in the path integral. The three-dimensional, the, the leading saddle point with these boundary yeah. Um, times, like, yeah, I guess that's up there. Yeah. There. 
Um, so with these boundary conditions, uh, you can't uh, you can't explit you can't write down the metric with these boundary conditions, uh, but you can actually it turns out calculate its action, uh, not in complete uh, closed form, but um, you can find a uh, prescription for how to calculate the action. Let me sort of draw a picture of what these geometries look like in Euclidean signature. There are various choices, uh, but if you have four operator insertions on the plane, so this, is, this plane that I'm drawing is the CFT plane, and the ADS emergent radial direction is R, uh, then what happens is there's saddle points that you can write down uh, which essentially connect these insertions in pairs. So there's one saddle point that looks like this. This is sort of a two-centered Euclidean uh, BTZ black hole. This saddle point can basically be constructed in detail. I mean, the formulas aren't very explicit, uh, but you can write down a differential, a differential equation whose solutions uh, are, are precisely this geometry that I've drawn. So if we compare, let's compare now gravity to CFT. So on the CFT side, uh, we said that the uh, heavy, 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 heavy correlators is the Virasoro vacuum block for the identity. On the gravity side, uh, we said it's the Einstein action for this particular saddle point. So CFT is equal to gravity, approximately, so long as the Virasoro block, which is e to the minus c over 6 f plus f bar, is the same as the Einstein action on this particular saddle. Make sense? Any questions about this? How we got to how we got there? So what you can't you can't explicitly construct the metric, um, but what you can do is write some differential equations that the metric have to satisfy. I think the easiest way to think about it is to think of it as a flat SL2C connection. And you there's you have to, if you can construct a flat SL2C connection with the right properties, which are essentially monogamy properties on this, on this background, then that defines for you this metric. Now, you can't exactly write down the formulas, but you can formally define the geometry that way. I'm not really going to go into that in detail, but maybe we can talk about it after. Other questions? It's, I, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't really know the answer to that question. I, it's, it's sort of confusing. Um, you know, we don't need to know the answer for these calculations because this is Euclidean. And you're asking what happens to two, two BTZs in Lorentzian signature. Um, there are some papers w that talk about multi-center BTZs in Lorentzian and they, and they can merge and things like that. But I'm not sure what the whole story is. These papers are, are a little subtle. Um, yeah, I don't have a good answer. Other questions? I'm a bit confused by the saddle point. So you identify that each saddle point is the vector. Because there is no sense in which if I can cut the program point and say this is the state that is dominating and identify it also as a vector. You, you can as a, as a statement about the representation that's dominating. I mean, the fact that I can draw this circle in CFT and contract it into the bulk 
is the fact that this is the vacuum block. So what happens if I cut this in the other If you cut it this way? Um, well, that's like asking how you decompose the vacuum S channel into the T channel. In this case, actually, you can, you can sort of do it using Teschner technology, but I'm not sure that it's been worked out in, any, in, in much detail. Oh, I, not, not that I know of. No, I think if you go, if you go to the other channel, then, uh, the, so in, in one channel, we have a geometric description, which is this one. But if you try to take this answer and interpret it in the T channel, then I, this is a sum of very heavy operators like black holes and UV and stuff. Oh, uh, you're saying, yeah, let's cut it this way, and then there's something. That's right. So I guess it should be possible to interpret that as a sum of black holes in the other channel, which would presumably be multi-center black holes. I don't know if anyone has done this. Other questions? OK, so this has to be true for holography to work. So of course, it is true. OK, so this is true. This is true. I won't have time to derive it. Um, I can tell you a couple ways that you can check it. Uh, one way is just brute force. OK, so you can, um, well, on the, on the CFT side, um, is brute force. If, if somebody handed you the Einstein action, then you could just take the Virasor conformal block, take its log, take the large C limit, check if it's equal. OK, so that'll work. Um, but uh, these functions are complicated. You know, we can't, we can't calculate the Einstein action in closed form on this saddle point. We can't even write the metric in closed form. We can't calculate these Fs in closed form. Um, but uh, there's something called the monodromy method I also won't have time to talk about the monodromy method is a differential equation that in principle tells you f, tells you little f. And what you can do is you can show that the Einstein action evaluated on shell follows from the same differential equation. So what you can do is you don't, you don't match the answers. Uh, what you do is you, you match the differential equations that these things have to satisfy and therefore show that they're equal. I won't talk about the monodromy method, but I'll tell you in one sentence what it is. It basically, uh, this was introduced by Zemlogikov in the, some of the original work on the semi-classical block. And the idea is that you're supposed to fl construct flat SL2C connections with certain monodromy properties and then um, you can use a ward identity, essentially, to then read off the um, semi-classical block. 3D gravity is also related to flat SL2C connections. So there's a uh, direct map between these two calculations. Other channels, remember we said that the uh, CFT answer is a sum of the identity in various channels. These, of course, are going to correspond to the other saddle points that you can draw, like that one. Uh, and um, the fact that the bulk is a sum over saddles guarantees that uh, your CFT is going to be manifestly crossing invariant, because that sum over saddles, just like we found in the partition function, that sum over saddles is uh, sum over channels. So again, we have the same sort of schematic formula we had there, which is that the answer in 3D gravity is like the sum over channels of the Virasoro vacuum block.
No. Well, they have to have the same weight. Yeah. I just was discussing the case where all four are heavy. There you can find an implicit match uh, between gravity and CFT. Now I want to turn to a case where you can really do explicit, uh, completely analytic closed form calculations, and this is the probe limit. And this is um, based on a paper by Fitzpatrick, Kaplan, and Walters and various follow-up work. So uh, the idea is to, instead of taking all four to be very heavy, let's take a correlation function like this, where we have two heavy operators and two medium operators. In the literature, these are called light. They're, they're much greater than 1, but much less than c. So 1, much less than h, much less than c. So in CFT, the story is the same. Uh, now, because the operators are different, there's only one channel to worry about. And we expect the cor this correlation function to be given by the, by the identity block with two medium operators and two heavy operators. If you did the problem, uh, the, the, the homework problem that Jared, one of Jared's homework problems, then um, you've calculated this medium, medium, heavy, heavy Virasoro block. And uh, the answer is exponential minus h phi c over 3 log beta psi over pi cinch pi l over beta psi, where beta psi is defined by the equation h psi minus c over 24 is pi squared c over 3 beta psi squared. So the point is just that uh, although we can't calculate the semi-classical block in general in a closed form, in this light, light, or, or medium, medium, heavy, heavy limit, uh, you can do it analytically. And there's various ways of doing that, one of which was in that homework problem. Where's this? Um, good question. Um, sorry, this should have been. Well, like I said. But I might be missing an I. So don't trust that exactly. Now the gravity side. So on the gravity side, let me just rewrite first uh, this correlator in a suggestive way by moving the size to the outside and putting bras and kets. OK, so we can think of this heavy, heavy, light, light correlator uh, as being a light probe or a medium probe of a heavy state psi. We said that heavy states are um, things that back react on the geometry. So if you take psi to have a large enough conformal dimension, then you just expect it to be a BTZ black hole. Now, we know from our discussion of the spectrum that at high energies, most of the states, in, uh, the vast majority of the states in 3D gravity are BTZ black holes. So that should be the interpretation of psi. Now, this is a bit subtle, because when we talk about eternal black holes in ADS, uh, that's really dual to the canonical ensemble. Now we're talking about a particular state, a particular microstate psi. Um, so uh, when I say it's a BTZ black hole, I mean this particular microstate uh, should be dual to something with the geometry of the BTZ black hole, but it's more like a black hole microstate. It's 
It's a particular black hole microstate. If we set up our operators in such a way that uh, the size are inserted at 0 and infinity, so this is really just the expectation value in the BTZ geometry, then uh, the, the picture here is that you have a BTZ black hole sitting at the middle of anti de Sitter. And then you want to calculate some probe two-point function in that background. Now, we said that medium operators travel on geodesics. So uh, phi is a geodesic probe. And um, that means if we insert phi, let's keep things simple by inserting the two phi's at the same time in this picture. So, this, so this size in, are inserted to create the state. And then there are two phi's inserted like this. And in the geodesic or WKB limit, we expect this correlation function to be fixed by the length of the geodesic, the space-like geodesic connecting these operators. That is, G gravity is approximately exponential minus h phi times the length of the geodesic. So on the CFT side, we got the vacuum block, which was this log cinch business. On the gravity side, it's supposed to be the geodesic length. For these to be equal, we need the log of this medium, medium, heavy, heavy block to be a geodesic length. In the BTZ black hole background. And it is. OK, so if you calculate this. If you just take the BTZ geometry, uh, there's a well-known formula for the geodesic length in BTZ, uh, especially, for example, it calculates entanglement entropy or uh, quasi-normal modes at, in certain limit. Uh, this length is given exactly by this log cinch formula. OK, questions about that? Sorry? Can I interpolate between the two cases by increasing the, the weight of the medium gas? Uh, yeah, yeah. So do I end up what, what we're talking about? The first physical effect that changes the vector x to the z? Oh, if you, go to next, if you go to the next order in, that, in the weight of the light probe? Yeah, if I start increasing a bit the uh, I don't know the answer to that. Are any of the authors in the audience that can answer that? No. Uh, may, may, I'm not sure if Jared and collaborators have looked at that, but I, I don't know the answer. OK, so in the last 10 minutes, I want to make a few comments about information loss and how this is relevant. So information loss. Gravity seems to violate unitarity. That's the black hole information problem. This is visible in various ways. There's Hawking's original version. There's things like the firewall paradox. Uh, there's a formulation due to Malasena where you can see this unitarity violation in late time 
correlators. The way this works is that you take t to be large, the time to be large, uh, and you calculate the correlator um, phi of 0, phi of t. So this is the autocorrelation function uh, in the BTZ background. The geodesic approximation to that calculation uh, you can find just by taking large times. You have to figure out what the cross ratio is uh, and plug it into this log z here, uh, but that's easy enough to do. And then you can t just take large t and ask what the correlation function looks like. So that geodesic approximation is going to give you e, is going to give you something that decays exponentially, e to the minus t h phi over beta. But unitarity doesn't allow this. Unitarity tells you that the late, the long time average of G of t goes like e to the minus entropy. In other words, correlation functions cannot decay to 0. This one is decaying to 0. It's getting too small. And no quantum system can have autocorrelation functions that get that small. This argument is pretty simple. Uh, the argument is that you just insert a complete set of states and write g of t as sum over n of psi um, I think I've mixed up my operators. OK, there's some matrix elements that show up in this sum, which I won't need. And I wrote them wrong, so I'm not going to try to write them down here. Uh, but there's, you can insert a complete set of states and write this autocorrelation function as a sum of matrix elements times e to the i, e to the i e t. And the reason, that, uh, correlations, the reason that correlators exponentially decay in a thermal ensemble is because of these phases. OK, so when you, when you, go, to late, when you go forward in time, these phases uh, in, a, in a system that doesn't have, um, say, equally spaced energy levels, these k phases are basically just going to be random. And at late times, this sum of terms is just everything is going to cancel because you have a sum of these wildly oscillating phases. But in a finite dimensional or in, in, a, in a quantum system with a finite, a finite number of states that are relevant, um, you, know, you, you expect these phases to cancel, but you don't expect them to cancel exactly. And they can't cancel exactly. Um, so the phases cancel but not they don't exactly cancel. And you can actually calculate this late time average and relate it to the number of states. And that's where this um, g of t goes as e to the minus s comes from. So the gravity answer is too small. On the other hand, uh, the CFT is obviously unitary because it's quantum mechanics. And in CFT, things evolve by e to the iht. h is Hermitian, so it's unitary. So the gravity seems to lose information. You can see this in the correlation function. The CFT clearly does not lose information, but we just showed that they're equal, right? We just showed that CFT, the correlation functions in CFT and gravity are equal. So uh, clearly there's some tension here. From a CFT point of view, it's clear what went wrong, though. From a CFT point of view, we made various approximations along the way. And we threw away lots of terms. We only kept the identity block. So from a CFT point of view, 
uh, it's clear how you're supposed to fix this. The resolution is that information loss from a CF CFT point of view is an artifact of the 1 over C expansion, that is the large C limit. The exact correlator in the CFT is given by this identity contribution plus lots of other stuff. So it's e to the minus c over 6 times the semi-classical block plus loop corrections plus non-perturbative, as we said before. And uh, so what's happening? We kept only this term. Why do we keep that term? We kept it because it was, it was exponentially large and dominating by exponential over all of these other terms. But at late times, we just said this term is becoming exponentially small, which means that these, these tiny terms that we were perfectly OK to throw away at early times we cannot throw away at late times. So what's going to happen is that uh, as we take t large, this term will get suppressed until these terms take over. So as t goes to infinity, these non-perturbative terms, which have not been calculated, presum but presumably should go like e to the minus s, become important. Another way of saying it is that the limits c to infinity and t to infinity just don't commute. When you take the large C limit, you get this leading saddle. But then when you go to large T, you have another big, you have another big number in the game. And your approximation breaks down. So I think the conclusion is that there really was never a, 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 there was never really an information paradox in the first place in this sense. I mean, when you actually try to turn the information paradox into a calculation, you always end up with some other big number in the game, in this case, t going to infinity. Uh, I think in more subtle cases like Hawking's calculation, it's the large number of quanta that you have to look at to talk about unitarity. But it's really the, the interplay between those two limits that's responsible for the information paradox, um, at least in terms of looking at the, the answer. Now, I don't, I, don't think that this, I don't think that this conclusion is a surprise. You know, I think this is sort of what People who expected, people who expect black holes to be unitary, this is what they expected. So this isn't really a surprise coming out of two-dimensional CFT. What's nice about this example uh, is that you can actually calculate everything. Okay, so this is the first example uh, where you have an explicit calculation you can do that gives the black hole answer, where information is apparently lost, as the leading term in a controlled approximation. Okay, so. Now, I don't think we, at this point, understand the subleading terms. I don't think we understand how to get the information back. But uh, at least we understand in a very explicit uh, way with clear calculations exactly what has been done to make information apparently lost. In terms of the paradox, though, I want to stress that this does not really resolve the information paradox. Um, you know, you could sort of separate the information paradox into three pieces. The first is 
why does the CFT seem non-unitary? The second is how does the CFT recover that information? So that's sort of the question. So the first question is, um, is has what we've just answered. It seems non-unitary because we've only kept this leading saddle and that wasn't allowed. The f second question, how does the CFT recover information, is a question of how you correct our calculation um, to get that e to the minus s. The third part of the information paradox is that you really cannot solve the information paradox in CFT. You have to solve it in gravity. And you have to answer the question of how does gravity recover the information. You know, if, we have, if we end up with an answer that's purely defined in conformal field theory, um, then I don't think we should be satisfied. Um, we need a gravity calculation or some modification of a gravity calculation that gives us that e to the minus s or tells us where that e to the minus s is hiding. I'm going to grade us here. So this one, I think, I think we're good on number one. You know, we just did the calculation. Um, we made some assumptions there, but we understand why that calculation is seeming to violate unitarity. How does the CFT recover information? Uh, well, there's some interesting work recently um, by Fitzpatrick and Kaplan and collaborators, but I think the question is still open of exactly how to deal with these non-perturbative contributions. Presumably, the details of this will depend on the microscopic theory. Exactly how information is recovered will depend on the UV and the microscopics, but is there something that we can say that's, that's universal? Is there some good lesson to be extracted here? I'm not sure. I'll give that a medium face. How does gravity recover the information? Uh, there, we're really still in the dark. And um, this one um, is sort of the real version of the information paradox. This is the question that Hawking originally asked. This is the question that we're supposed to answer if we really understand uh, how, how quantum gravity works in ADS. And um, maybe, maybe these first two are, are good steps toward that. But really, this is, the, this is the problem of solving the information paradox. And that has not been solved. Presumably, the answer has to do with the fact that locality breaks down at finite central charge or at finite Newton's constant. But then what do you replace it with? What are we supposed to do on the gravity side that gets back um, the information? So I'm out of time. Uh, let me summarize everything I said by the statement that uh, at large central charge, in a theory with a large gap, the conformal block expansion is especially powerful. And the contributions in three dimension, in 3D gravity, the contributions from uh, the identity block alone are enough to account for the, universal, for the universal properties of gravity um, in the bulk. In higher dimensions, the story is going to be much more complicated. There are some things that can be said, but certainly universality in higher dimensions is a trickier story uh, because the stress tensor, the organization of the stress tensors uh, is something that has to happen dynamically. It's not something that's forced on you by the algebra. It's not forced on you by, there is no analog of Virasoro. So somehow the reorganization of the multi-stress tensor problem has to happen dynamically as you uh, essentially push up the gap of, high, of heavy operators. So that question is much more difficult. OK, I'll stop there for questions. The question is whether there's a kinematics where instead of exponentials, these are phases. Yeah, I was looking in the Which one were you looking at? In this one. Yeah. 
Um, well, these are these non-perturbative contributions are a sum of wildly oscillating phases. But you want something more than that? I mean, like even the leading one becomes just a. So. Oh, no, the leading one. Well, the leading one is the one we just calculated, and it was exponential. Um, this is Lorentzian. Okay. This is Lorentzian. So we, I, here I was discussing a Lorentzian correlation function where you insert one at time zero and the other one at late times. And we were getting these exponential decay. You, I guess you're looking for a regime where we can better, where we can force this to dominate. Um, you know, I think it's going to be hard because it's not, it's not going to be universal. So we have to figure out what the right question is. Like before we can answer the question, we sort of have to figure out what the right question is. Um, it's not going to be that we can just have, do some calculation along the lines of done in these lectures and, and just extract and, and calculate this term. I think that's just not even supposed to be possible. So what exactly are we supposed to be able to extract? I'm not sure. I think there is. I think there is. Um, yes. Yeah. We should all calculate it. I think so. We, but but I don't think it's been done. I think um, coming into that is is this is this issue of sort of a non-perturbative version of HKLL, and um, the just in the last few months or so, the kinds of you know the, most of what I described is is a couple years old. In the last few months, I think there is now sort of a, at least a, a proposal for a non-perturbative HKLL um, that is a generalization of what I've talked about. And the natural question to then ask would be what happens when you start trying to approach or go behind the black hole horizon, but I don't think that's been done. <laughs> 